The other day, my daughter asked me, Daddy, is your conference boring? <laughs> and I felt reasonably confident in answering no. In fact, our first speaker is one of the most interesting writers I know, and that's why I'm so pleased that he's agreed to speak to us today. In his day job, he's written for dozens of top brands and specialises in working with senior execs, particularly, particularly during crises. And most notably, he helped BP craft its messages in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon spill. He also co-founded 26, the Writers' Association. He's done print and radio journalism, judged many writing and design awards, and written a book. Here to discuss the serious business of stories, it's Tim Rich. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. So the serious business of stories, um, I've also given myself the liberty of uh, an additional title, The Battle Against Abstraction, because I think that when you introduce an enemy into proceedings, life begins to get more interesting, and I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. I think it's worth noting just at the beginning you know, how extraordinary it is, the, the profile with which stories have um, come to the fore in, in business. I mean, you, just, you can't move for someone talking about storytelling or brands um, talking about themselves in terms of the story. I mean, here's Nutella, everyone's favorite hazelnut spread, chooses to mark its 50 year anniversary with a campaign called 50 Years Full of Stories. Uh, I think they missed a better line, which was 50 years of spreading stories, but what do I know? Here's a restaurant simply called Story. Uh, you go to their website. This is a little bit from their About Us page. At Story, the premise is simple. We seek to tell our story through the food we serve. Our dishes are an edible story, each one inspired by a memory. Uh, I don't know about you. It's slightly over-egging the story metaphor for my taste. But um, I show these two examples to begin with because it's not just story structure or story approach that's become uh, more popular. It's also this kind of rather self-conscious use of the word story. Here's Microsoft. Uh, they've got a section on their website simply called Stories. And they also have someone, I think it's this chap on the left possibly, uh, who is called a Chief Storytelling Officer. Probably referred to internally as the CSO. Uh, and like every good trend, we're already seeing a backlash. <laughs> this is one of the gentler pushes back against uh, uh, stories and, and, and branded content. I think it's worth just taking a little bit, a uh, bit of a step back and uh, thinking through why are so many companies using stories in this high-profile way, and why are they doing it in such a self-conscious way? One answer might be fashion. Uh, you know, we're in the creative industry, but there's a lot of copying that goes on. I think also it might be because there's a lot of anxiety within businesses. I think there's a lot of anxiety about how they connect with the outside world. You know, to use a bit of corporate parlance, uh, I think they're, they're anxious about how they reach out to their external stakeholders. There's a kind of concern about traditional media and whether it's really reaching people and also an experience and suspicion in some cases about new media. And story represents to many a sort of golden common ground, a proven way in which you can reach people, perhaps in a more equal way, a, a warmer way. And I think there's some truth to that. And I'll come on to talk about uh, some of the reasons why stories are uh, so, so powerful. But I think there's a bigger issue here as well, in a sense, a more practical issue, which is that lots of companies that claim to be telling stories really aren't. They're just communicating the same old way, but tarting it up with the word story. Uh, this is an example from a US healthcare company called Aetna. Uh, can you all read that at the back? And, you know, to be frank, when I read this, if, if anything, it makes me uh, feel a little bit queasy. But the, 
the, the serious problem with it is, is that it's not a story. It's just a description. It's the same old kind of corporate description that you see from, from, from countless companies. A couple of years ago, I decided to do a little bit of thinking work, which was, you know, I was using the term story in a fairly willy-nilly way, but actually, what is a story? What's the difference between a story and some other kind of communication or uh, expression? And this is what I came up with. And it's just my view. I'm sure that lots of other people have their own uh, theory of sort of the essence of story, uh, you know, to use the cliche, the DNA of story. Uh, for me, a story has these three elements to it. A challenge. There's always something to overcome. There's a risk. There's a danger. There's a threat. There's a mystery. There's something that needs to, to be addressed and changed. Action. An individual or a group of people to carry out specific actions in response to the challenge. They might dilly-dally, they might prevaricate, there might be all sorts of twists and turns along the way, but they'll actually do specific, tangible things in response specifically to the challenge. And then transformation. The world will be a changed place as a result of their actions. And also, they'll be changed as people, they'll be changed as characters, not always for the, for the good, sometimes for the worst. The thing I really want to emphasize today is just the importance of, of challenge. With businesses, it's often the bit that they least want to talk about. It's the, it's the problems, it's the, it's the dangers, it's the, it's the threats. Um, but it's within that that you find the raw material that gives you energy, that gives the energy for narrative momentum. It's the bit that we have to take our clients into to, to find the most interesting uh, material. You know, we just, I just love this, this quote from John le Carre, um, because for me it captures this point about the, the importance of challenge and the way in which challenge creates the dynamic of the story. So the cat sat on the mat is not the beginning of a story, but the cat sat on the dog's mat is. There's a difference between just mere description and something that has the energy of a story. And lots of brands and businesses today who claim to be storytelling are actually just describing the same old corporate cat sitting on the same old corporate mat. So why should we, why should we even care about uh, stories? You know, why is it important? Well, as an aside, I think, you know, of course, there are lots of occasions when story is entirely the wrong way to communicate. I'm not one of those people that uh, just thinks story is always the answer. I'm a little bit suspicious about some of the creative agencies that position themselves entirely around story and narrative. But when you do choose to use a story approach, a story format, it can be just much more compelling than standard description, standard reporting. Uh, it can be much more evocative from the Latin, evocare, to summon up. It summon up, summons up the emotion. Uh, there's that right brain element. It brings in feeling, something that's very difficult to get into description, to get into reporting. And then it's more memorable. You know, people tend to remember a good story more than information, more than description, uh, more, than, more than reporting. I think there are some other qualities about stories that are incredibly important as well. It's the material nature of the language that comes out in a story. A story can be a great disciplining structure for your language. It sort of almost wills you to humanize what you're talking about. Even if your information is very abstract, very complex, very difficult, it, it will draw it down to a human scale. And that's what helps it to then evoke emotion in you. I love this, uh, the opening to Dante's uh, The Inferno. I love it for lots of reasons. Now, partly because it just illustrates uh, this point about bringing the challenge out. You know, the drama is in there, the threat is in there. You've already got the beginning of a, of a, a narrator, possibly a, a subject. You've got that idea of, of place. It might be a place of the imagination. It might be a real physical place. But the other reason I love this is because um, you can often get quite a pushback when you're talking about stories and storytelling within business. You'll get cynics who say, well, you know, aren't stories just for children? Aren't they a bit simplistic? 
And actually, the Inferno is a great example of a relatively simple story structure. Uh, it's a quest, I suppose, in some ways. But on top of that, you have this incredibly sophisticated um, symphony of, of meanings going on. You know, it's about the politics um, of Florence. It's a metaphorical journey of the soul from, from life into, into death. Uh, it's, it's about love, it's about art, it's about relationships, it's about all sorts of things. And I think that you know, if you're working with stories, you need to have the confidence in the form to push back when people come out with, with cynicism uh, about story structure. So challenge action transformation. This is just what I find incredibly useful when writing for clients sometimes. And also, I find it really useful when I'm analyzing communications for clients, when something seems to be lacking, when there seems to be a lack of intensity or, uh, or drama or, or color. It's been incredibly useful for me. I just want to show some examples of stories that, that follow this form in some way uh, that, that are out there in sort of commercial communication. Does anyone know who this character is? See, there's a really good example of um, the memorability of, of stories. That ad is, uh, I think it's 31 years old. I'm aware that there might be some young people in the audience. <laughs> so I should explain who J.R. Hartley is. So just briefly, this lovely chap goes for a walk around the second-hand bookshops of Charing Cross Road in search of uh, an out-of-print book called Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley. And he has no luck. He returns home, sort of rather sad, tired figure, and his loving daughter points out a piece of technology to him called the telephone directory <laughs> and says that if he uses another piece of technology called the electric telephone, he can actually contact many more bookshops to find out uh, if one of them stocks this book. He finally finds one, uh, and uh, they ask him his name, and he says, yes, my name is J.R. Hartley. He is the author of the book that he's searching for. Now, I've just sort of rather murdered a rather beautiful piece of filmmaking <laughs> in my terrible telling of this, but um, there you have challenge, action, transformation in a really lovely, warm sense. Challenge, you know, there's a, there's a lost item. He's in search of something. Action, he actually takes himself out in, into the world. And transformation, you, well, you can see it written on on his face. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, the digital spawn of Yellow Pages, Yell, uh, did some above-the-line advertising. And they chose to actually tell the same story. It's the same plot, but instead of an author, you have a rave DJ called Davey Lately. And I think, actually, he's the, he's the, the real DJ. And he goes in search of this obscure 12-inch record that he, he produced that's, uh, that's now out of, out of stock. Uh, and actually, it's also a really lovely piece of filmmaking. I, I like the ad. You can see them on YouTube. The, the reason why I show this is, is that actually, I think we're going to see more and more of the backlash against storytelling. I think that um, we're going to see a lot of people saying that perhaps you know, we now live in a post-storytelling age stories are dead, fill in blank in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the new way of, of communicating. But actually, I think we need to maintain our confidence in the story form. And this just sort of shows you how it can continue to work for you through the, through the ages, if you like. I think we need to not be swayed um, when storytelling becomes unfashionable for a bit. One of the things that perhaps a little bit different. I hesitate to say that anything's new in our industry because there are always presidents and you always end up with egg on your face. But perhaps something that's a little bit new is the scale with which brands go in search of drama, go in search of um, the story. And here's an example from uh, Red Bull, who, who do a great job of... Uh, actually creating the drama around their brand. You know, it's a, it's a commodity product, essentially, but they're brilliant at creating stories. So, for example, here's just a, a snap from the website for the uh, amazing things they did with Felix Baumgartner, the 
the balloonist who took a, a helium balloon, I think it was, up to the edge of the stratosphere, leapt off and uh, did a free fall to Earth, breaking all sorts of world speed records along the way. And their association with that initiative creates the challenge, it creates the danger, it makes things interesting, it gives an intensity to the communications. And if that stunt, that event is your, your meta story, then you can get all sorts of mini stories out of it that, that have that kind of rub off effect, have that excitement as, as, as part of their, um, the, way that they, the way that they talk. And I think this is quite an interesting example of the way in which story can make sponsorship even more interesting, more compelling, uh, more memorable, more shareable. I think there's something else about this as well, which is that as writers and, and communicators, that sometimes with story we need to lift our eyes up from the page and away from the screen, and we need to also think a little bit like film directors, like TV producers, like dramatists. Um, we need to think like... Uh, event producers, uh, because story can work in, in all sorts of ways beyond words, but we can use our skills with words to actually make it meaningful to, to draw out the story that's, that's going to be memorable. Uh, a lot of my work is with companies helping them to define what their story is and then to tell it to the world. And I first got interested in that that aspect of communication back in 1999 and I launched a, a business then and one of the things that, that I learned when I launched that business is that from a certain angle my head looks exactly like a football. It's a bit of a surprise to my mum I have to say but um, along with a couple of friends uh, I wrote a book about my experiences of being a football fan and we got a little bit carried away we thought, actually, we can build a business on this. We can build a whole range of books for, for football fans, merchandise. We created a website. We created some multiplayer games. Uh, and it was, it was incredibly exciting. We were basically riding the dot-com bubble. And we found ourselves in a merchant bank in the city asking for two and a half million pounds and people sort of nodding sagely and, and not kicking us out, which is quite an experience. And then just a few weeks later, the dot-com bubble burst, and a few months later on, further down the line, uh, the company burst as well for a number of reasons. And we learned an enormous amount from that experience. I learned that you should be wary when people describe your business model as interestingly innovative. But I also learn about what happens when your company has real fire in its belly. Because we sort of had the spirit of a campaign about us. We were fed up. As football fans, we were fed up with the substandard products that we were given. Um, shoddy products that were often overpriced merely because we were fans. And so that was our enemy, in a way. But we were doing something positive about it. We were going out and aiming to create... Um, better things, things that would really appeal to, to fans. And of course, we saw an opportunity in that. And it was just amazing the way in which people took our calls, would have meetings with us, would actually talk to other people about what we were doing. You know, again, this idea of sharing the story. People really responded to the fact that we had that sort of energy within us. And that's one of the things that I've tried to bring to a lot of the companies that I've worked with. It's just that idea of finding the fire in, in your belly. Even if you're not a campaigning organisation, even if you are a sort of a straight, hard-nosed profit machine, you know, why do you exist? Get, get to the existential heart. Why does that organisation exist? I don't apologise for showing an example from Innocent Drinks at a copywriting conference because I just think this is one of the best founder's stories uh, out there. And I'm just going to read this out, because I think at the back it might be a little bit difficult to read. In the summer of 1998, when we had developed our first recipes, but were still nervous about giving up our proper jobs, we bought £500 worth of fruit, turned it into smoothies, and sold them from a stall at a little music festival in London. We put up a big sign saying, 
do you think we should give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And put out a bin saying yes and a bin saying no and ask people to put the empty bottle in the right bin. At the end of the weekend, the yes bin was full. So we went in the next day and resigned. Underneath that story, I see that challenge action transformation structure. The challenge of should we give up our jobs? There's the risk. You know, the action, they go out and they ask their customers whether this is a good idea. And that's right at the spirit of, of innocence. And then transformation, well, yes, the company's born. But also that other thing that you get from a story, there's that lovely material language. You've got the visual imagery of the yes, no bin, something that's actually going to stay, stay with you. So if that's story format, if that's story approach, uh, actually, before I go on, I just, as an aside, that's three sentences. And I think they're really easy to read. And I think they're quite a nice counterblast to the cliches that we all have to sort of write in incredibly short, punchy sentences these days. If that's a story approach to, to Innocent, how would, that, how would that sound? How would that read if it came out in a classic kind of corporate description? I think it'd be something a bit like that. It's shorter, it's incredibly succinct, it's incredibly generic, it's completely unmemorable, and it's not the sort of thing that anyone would want to share with anyone else. A lot of my work, um, as Tom said earlier, is with companies that are in the middle of crisis. It's a really interesting time to, to work with companies because when their back's against the wall, they often do some of their best communicating. Back in 2002, Ericsson asked me to come and work with them on their corporate communications. They had just made the biggest loss in Swedish history. And they were a company that was sort of relatively conservative as, as communicators. And we said to them, you're a sort of classic why point in terms of crisis communications. You could go to the left and you can be legalistic and more abstract in the way that you talk about what's going on. And that's a completely legitimate and effective tactic when you're in the midst of crisis for some companies in some situations. The opposite of that is to really come out and make your argument. Come out and tell the story of what's going on. Just be careful about ending up somewhere between these two poles because that's the sort of that's the dangerous situation and to their credit they said no we feel that we do have an argument in us we we feel that we can see a, you know a more positive future and we want to come out and and talk to the world about that so this was the front cover of their annual report that year i think you can already see the sort of spirit of story in there you know, we went big on the challenge. When you open up the report inside, there's a very structured argument. And I wasn't so clear about challenge action transformation at that point, but looking back, it sort of broadly follows that structure. It's a very persuasive piece, you know, even if I say so myself. It had, it had a very powerful effect for Ericsson. And I think that one of the reasons why it had impact was not just the argument, but it was that the company were seen to be communicating in a different way. In a sense, language was indicating that the culture within the company was, was changing. Um, and that's incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, more recently, as, as Tom said, I was working for BP uh, before, during, and after the, the terrible accident and oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And I just sort of really want to, to talk about one thing that came from that. And it might, it might just seem a simplistic point to make, but I think it's so important that I'm going to make it. And that's that we need to remember that the stories we create within companies go out into an incredibly contested world. 
You know, stories are organic. They change. Everyone has their own version in their head. They evolve according to how the company evolves its own story, but also the journalism, the comment, um, you know, particularly with blogs and social media and, and the rest of it. And we all know that. That's sort of a truism. But I think it can sometimes get lost. The external perspective can sometimes get lost within the company when you're communicating, particularly when you're communicating under difficult circumstances or in a hurry. You have lots of other people who might be affecting your communications process who are perhaps less attuned or less interested in or less motivated by the external world. And part of our job as writers and communicators is to just keep staying in that, that middle ground between the audience and, and the client. But just feel that tension between the two. And don't let the communications process become too internally focused because your story will just get killed when it goes out. Uh, and BP, to their credit, had all sorts of communication issues, of course, um, around the Gulf of Mexico. But they also wanted to come out and, and be open in how they communicated. They wanted to, to, to mount an argument. They were very open to what else was being said out there. They were aware that the story was, was going, to, going to evolve. This is uh, some words from the Sydney Morning Herald reviewing the annual review that I wrote for BP. And I love this piece. I love it for lots of reasons. I love the phrase, it's a textual symphony of squirming. I think that's brilliant. I like it as a propagandist because um, despite the kind of the headlines and the, the attention grabbing bit, a lot of the, the piece that followed actually agreed with the argument that we'd, we'd put forward. So, you know, there was a sort of sly enjoyment to that. But I also enjoy it as a citizen. Uh, it's a, just a reminder about that contested space. It's a reminder that um, you know, the world is alive with opinion, that we've got the, a press who are prepared to take company stories apart, to challenge company stories. And it's also a good reminder that you know, we need to be really good at the stories we develop for companies. We need to compete. It's a, you know, stories operate at a competitive level. And I think this just leads me on to a point about a broader problem that I see with companies and communications and language. And I'm not now talking about companies such as BP and Ericsson that are in the midst of crisis. This is a kind of more general point. I think one of the obstacles to good communications within a lot of companies, particularly corporates, I think is just their lack of confidence in themselves as an organization. I think a lot of companies have, um, they've almost lost confidence in profit. They've almost become embarrassed about profit. Um, they've almost become shy of talking about the social and economic and financial, financial benefits of the products and services that they create. They often seem more comfortable talking about how they're minimizing their impacts, their environmental impacts, or how they contribute to the wider community. And all of those things are incredibly important. But I think that a lot of the fire has gone out of the belly of, of big companies. And I think there's an opportunity for us as writers to actually challenge some of the companies we work for if we see that that's going on. To actually try to draw the company back to its reason to exist, to, to, to challenge it, to try to make it more confident about itself. And of course, it's not true of all companies. There are all sorts of dynamic and entrepreneurial and um, exciting companies. But I'm surprised by the number of companies that I think are really lacking uh, a powerful spirit about, them, about themselves. I sometimes see the world through a sort of rather simplistic lens of television personalities. Perhaps with rose-tinted spectacles, I think about the businesses of the 60s and 70s as a sort of Alan Wicker figure, uh, cosmopolitan, confident, um, 
sort of rather optimistic about the world, uh, rather excited about the world. And I think that a lot of corporates and businesses today are a little bit more like Ronnie Corbett. They start off on the back foot. They're actually incredibly defensive about themselves. I think a lot of them have ingested the critiques of NGOs and journalists, um, and they've lost track of, of, of their own story. So I do think that there is this opportunity for us to help a lot of companies raise their, raise their game. I think one of, the, one of the symptoms of this lack of confidence is this terrible abstract language that we, that we still see. We've been going on about jargon for years and years and years, but you know, it's still so much of it out there. And on Twitter and in blogs, copywriters are forever railing against how awful jargon is. And, and I'm absolutely the same. I've written countless articles about it and making comments about it. Uh, and this sort of you know, degraded abstract language, it is awful. But I don't think it's good enough anymore for us to simply say, isn't it horrid? Isn't it ugly? Isn't it awful? I think we need to do more work on looking at the root causes of why companies put out this sort of stuff. I mean, this is from a company that does incredibly material work with highways and railways and all sorts of important stuff. And yet somehow that important activity has become translated into this strange, garbled, abstract language. I mean, I'm not even going to talk about the lack of the consistent full stop on the end uh, or, the, or the other millions of things because I'm going to end up down that jargon route. I think we need to raise our game. I think we need to work harder to work out why the culture of businesses produce this sort of stuff, how we can uh, help to challenge that, how we can help companies to actually communicate in a much more powerful, material way. And story can be part of that. I think that as writers and as communicators, um, we perhaps need to lift our game. I might just be talking about myself here, but you know, maybe there's some, some resonance. Uh, I think we, we need to be much more challenging. I think you know, we need to be a little bit less like lovely George from Rainbow, who's rather slow in coming forward, uh, who's rather shy. I think we sometimes need to be a little bit more like his colleague Zippy. I think we need to be a bit louder, a bit more intense, a bit more theatrical, a bit more challenging, sometimes a bit more difficult. Uh, somewhere between these two, you know, this is the sort of the yin and yang of the 21st century professional copywriter, kind of <laughs> hovering between the two. And I'm, and I'm not talking about Bungle. And so challenge, action, transformation. This is the structure and approach I found incredibly useful. Uh, this is the, the, the approach that, that I take into companies, and it's, it's, it's working well for me in all sorts of ways. But I'm also conscious that at this conference, of all conferences, I should try to end on something single-minded. So I really just want to emphasize the importance of challenge. Like I said, it's often the bit that businesses don't want to get into but it's where you find the, the gold stuff. It's where you find the, the energy. It's where um, the, the power of communications um, in a story format can really come from. So that's really what I emphasize, to, em emphasize today. Let's just make sure that with our clients that we get right into the difficult stuff, sometimes the stuff that makes them uncomfortable. It's from the challenge that the power of a, a story comes. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. That was excellent. Um, any questions for Tim? We've just got a few, um, few moments here, yeah, just over there in the red top. Can you just wait for there's a microphone coming? Sorry. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, you mentioned earlier on that you said a comment um, at that time. I wasn't really very aware about um, challenge action transformation. 
what, how did you become aware of that? So I think that um, it was partly the fact that everyone was starting to talk about storytelling. And uh, you know, it was becoming fashionable, I suppose. And it made me think, hang on a minute, no one's really defining a story. A lot of the examples that were given as stories from brands and companies just, just weren't stories. And I thought there's something amiss. And this is still going on. I mean, I went to an event uh, three weeks ago, um, an, a creative industry event called Storytelling that had four speakers. And only one of those speakers actually talked about stories. The other three just talked about the creative work that they did. And it had just been given this kind of title of story. It's as if it's got a sort of magic property in some way. But actually, you know, I was, I was really disappointed because they weren't, weren't really getting to the nub of narrative. They weren't putting forward some kind of view about uh, what's specific about story. I think also, you know, I was conscious that we know culturally stories are powerful. Um, but why? And, of course, lots of people have done work, particularly around uh, Hollywood, uh, on this. But within copywriting, within communications... You know, I think that we were perhaps using story in a rather unconscious way and we weren't thinking it through. And if you're not analysing what's making something powerful, it's incredibly hard to diagnose the problems when a communication isn't working. So, yeah, I just spent some time kind of thinking through what is it for me that makes the story different? And I'm conscious that other, you know, other people will have their own uh, definitions, their own structures. That's the most pared down, simplistic, right at the heart uh, of the differentiation of what a story is for me. Of course, on top of that, you then have all different types of story. You know, you have quest, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> Andy. It's coming. Yes, yeah, it's, it's coming. It's here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, really interesting speech. Um, obviously, your work has been a lot with big brands like BP and um, Ericsson, but we, we know that culturally and literally and neurologically, storytelling has always been about individual human beings or occasionally yeah. rabbits or hedgehogs as the hero. And I wondered whether you feel there are particular challenges in positioning a corporate entity as the hero of a story. Yeah, it is, because... <clears throat> Because sometimes the wonderful simplicity of a very personal hero-led piece just doesn't feel credible when you're talking about an enormous organization. So I think technically, you can sometimes use the, the question of who is the hero in this scenario. That's almost like the closed door work. But I think you have to be very careful about bestowing heroic status on a company because particularly with a big company, everyone knows they make mistakes. You know, employees have an entirely broad range of feelings about their own company. Uh, you know, so I, I think you just you have to be very, very careful about that. I haven't done a lot of work thinking, you know, what is the essential difference between the single actor and, and, and the group. But I think that... The key bit in my structure is when you move from the challenge into the action and the company, and you look at the company's, it's their decisive action. That's the key bit. It's when the company almost unites together to act in a certain way in response to the challenge. That's when you begin to get the kind of the clear drama. Okay, well, we need to move along. So uh, if you have any other questions for Tim, then please just hold them because he'll be on our panel later on. So thanks very much, Tim Rich. Thanks.